do inside of three business days. There was some effort to clarify what it was, both in 01 and 2012. And this is how I remember it, particularly for folks who are starting out. Three choices in three business days. Choice number one, yes, the records are subject to the Open Records Act, and here they are. That's the answer we all want, the yes response. Yes, the records are subject to the Open Records Act, and here they are. Choice number two inside the three business days. Yes, the records are subject to the Open Records Act, subject to disclosure. However, they are not available right now. They are in archives across town. They are unavailable. It will take us a while to get them. So the second response is yes, and an estimated timetable of when they will be available. So that's what I call your mid-level response. Yes. And I'll get them to you in 10 days, I'll get them to you in 14 days. Not yes, I'll get them to you in five years. Not gonna work. Yes, I'll get them to you in a couple weeks. Third choice is the answer we don't want, the no. No, the records are not subject to the Open Records <laughs> Act. And the public agency is required to cite the section of the law, the code section, typically under Georgia Code Section 50, dash 18 dash 70 and following exceptions a basic exception for example the medical records of a public employee would not be subject to release and if the public agency is telling you no you can't have them it has to tell you under what code section they're saying no so to review three business days is the time for a public agency to respond and they have three <coughs> options inside of the three business days Yes, there are the records. Two, yes, if the records are subject to release, I'll get them to you in probably two weeks. Three, no, the records are not subject to release under XYZ code section. Something new that popped in in 2012 is rolling production. The idea that if a portion of the records, let's say, you're looking for a personnel file and some of it's ready right now or accessible, as soon as it becomes available, that should be made, even if, if that should be made available and produced regardless of whether or not uh, the rest of the material is gonna be forthcoming. Now what about the basic record? When I walk into the police department, and I always have to laugh about police departments, who's here from Gwinnett? Uh, one of them, um, I won't identify who, and frankly, I can't remember who it was. We I probably got remember. I, 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 <laughs> I um, got into it with the public information officer of the police department, and she told me I don't know anything about the Open Records Act. I said, okay, that's, that's fine. I mean, it was, um, it was sort of one of those moments when I was like, uh, okay. What about if you want an incident report that is probably readily available? If you walk into the police department and if you, it's there, the agency can't wait the three business days just because the statute says up to three business days. It, 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 it's gotta be released if it's readily available and it's gotta be released now. You can't, they, in other words, in short, a public agency can't just wait because they're allowed three business days. If it's there and it's ready, it needs to be produced. I know all of you are thinking, yeah, what if you don't get a response at all? And we're gonna save that question till the afternoon because that's a lengthy one um, that I, everybody, including me, don't forget, I used to open records act in my private practice to get records. Um, so I've been stonewall as well, so. Um, but in any case, that's the way the open records act is supposed to work. And I understand that it doesn't always work that way, but the three business days um, and the three choices inside the three business days, rolling production, stuff being made available as, as, as soon as it, it, it is ready, and an agency can't use the uh, three days to hold out on you. All right, what happens though? What's supposed to happen? You know, it's a case I almost litigated about a decade ago, the idea of access versus copies, which is gonna be our segue to costs. What does our Open Records Act really give us the entitlement to? Does it give us the right to copies? Does it require a public agency to mail things? Or 
is it an access statute? I'm curious because the answer isn't exactly so clear in the law. How many think it's just uh, an access statute, meaning you get to view record? Just show of hands. How many think it's an access and copying statute? How many don't want to think? <laughs> yeah, I mean, you know, it's, it's something that I've actually contemplated writing some kind of legal article on because it's not, it, it's not as clear, but essentially the, the Open Records Act in Georgia was written as an access statute. And some, you know, I, the case I almost took, um, the great thing is I remember nothing, which um, is helpful in many ways, but it was a, a, a woman in South Georgia who did an open record request for something in North Georgia, and the public agency in North Georgia said, sure, come on up. Records are here ready for you to look at. So I thought it was sort of a, a fascinating question. I mean, it still is a question, does the agency have to copy the records? And we'll talk about what to pay for. And that's something also that I might want to save for the afternoon, because I mean, no one ever wants to hear your question. I love telling clients how interesting. Nobody wants to hear it interesting, because that means there's no answer. But it's, um, I mean, it's written as an access statute, meaning the public agency is required to make the records available. Most public agencies are going to want, not want to see us. They're not going to want to deal with us. They're going to want to send us copies. And that's why the copying and uh, the fees and all that kind of um, stuff, which I'll talk about next. But keep that in mind. One of the new things from 2012 that I like very much is you get to bring in your own phone, snap pictures, all of that's sort of in the statute now. Um, I mean, it was always sort of, it was always, that was the way some people did it, but it's pretty clear you can bring in your own copying device now, and you can make your own copies, and you can do um, copy as you like. But traditionally, certainly in Georgia for the past few decades and most other states, there has been a schedule of costs and um, a copying um, mechanism. Who knows um, what it is today in Georgia? How much can an agency charge per page? That's correct, up to 10 cents. I might point out to you that you might ask, are the costs to be waived? And many public interest organizations do. What was the law uh, until uh, April 17, 2012? What was the per cost per page? Up to 25 cents. I bring that up to you for a, um, something where you could see that the media, who is very interested in open records and meetings issues, its interest often diverges from the public's interest. The media made a trade at this negotiating table in 2012 for the 10 cents per page. The media said, look, Pinkos, you can copy documents for three cents, so we don't need up to 25 cents per page. But they traded, and I, so when I say they, we, the trade was redaction. Now public agency allegedly can charge when it redacts the names, social security numbers. I wasn't happy about that. I, um, in many cases, that has been one of the very public alleged triumphs of the media and the public interest that the cost per page is down from up to 25 cents per page down to up to 10 cents per page. The point is, you will get and you should ask for a fee estimate and it should say to you, pages times up to 10 cents, and then uh, reasonable search and retrieval fees based on the hourly rate of the lowest paid person capable of doing the work. Meaning, you can charge for some staff time in getting the records out. Does that mean county attorney time? Not to pick on Gwinnett, a great case from the 80s out of Gwinnett County where uh, it, it was Trammell. You can pick on Gwinnett, we do. Was <laughs> Trammell one of your officials in the 80s? T R A M M E L L? His was something named. There was a lawyer, Trammell. Okay, yeah, I think his name is in the st style of the case. Some agency in Gwinnett was charging county attorney time to calculate the rate of staff time to, and um, Supreme Court said, 
that's ridiculous. It's got to be the lowest hourly rate of the, or the hourly rate of the lowest paid person capable of doing the work. So we're talking about 13 50 an hour, 15.50. So the formula, uh, I'm, I'm digressing, is up to 10 cents per page plus reasonable search and retrieval time for staff time based on the hourly rate of the lowest paid person capable of doing the work. And the first 15 minutes of search and retrieval time is, is free. Now that concept of it being free goes back to my idea, if you walk in and you want a record and it's readily available, not only can the county not wait its three business days, it's also the idea is that it's not going to charge you to hand you a record through the glass window. Are these things working in principle and practice? Perhaps not, which is why everybody is in this room. But that, again, is the way the law is supposed to work. Let's digress for a moment and talk about email, web, access and things like that. As I mentioned earlier, in 2012, it was the first time Georgia's law ever really had some significant um, recognition of how business was really being done. It, uh, ma'am, come on up here. You can just stare right at me. I'll move the, the law. Um, um, in 2012, it was really the first time that the um, law really talked about electronic access, web um, access. Let me get your opinion on this, because I think it's an interesting question. Um, when you send an open record request to Putnam County, where I live now part-time, can... Um, yeah, I'll wow. tell you that. I'll talk yeah. to you about that. Yeah, um, <laughs> I was tired of the cat. Um, when you, can the public official, can the custodian of the records say, it's online, you can get it there, or do they have to make some affirmative action? Do they have to do something to require you, or, or, or to comply with their obligations? Who thinks, I, can you see I'm interested in everybody's opinion? I want to be, I want to learn how the new law is working. That's why I'm asking all these questions. I want to see what worked and what, or what is working and what's not. Um, how many um, people think it's enough for a public official just to say you can go to the website? Let me make comment on that. I think it's great if they do that, but if it's somebody like my father that wanted something that doesn't have a computer, it's a whole different thing. And that, that's uh, actually, I'll tell you this, you mm -hmm. keep thinking Jim thinks I know so much. I was like, yeah, sure, that's a good response. Well, the powers that be, the lawyers who know much more than me, said, hell, what are, you, what are you kidding? No way. You can make that as an option. You can say it is available to you on the website. However, if you'd like me to produce it, I can get it to you now in, in an estimated timetable. So it does seem to me that it's one option, and I think it is good as well, the more... Um, agencies that use web sites and such. I will say that there's a general background in the Open Records Act that talks about um, where the public agency can, can make records available electronically. It should. So there's a push for public agencies to do that. It's not always um, happening, but it's certainly um, a push. But um, the other change that may or may not be useful to those people in this room that was a big deal for bigger media like the Making Telegraph and such are database, access to databases. It, there used to be some great stories in, for those of us who do this work where a sheriff in South Georgia said, yeah, come on, you can have access. Here, sit down at my computer. Well, nobody knew how to work the program that he uh, had kept his data on until we pretty much, I mean, that was obviously not real access. So there was a push and a stress that the law um, would say access needs to be reasonable access, real access, and there's this thing in the law that's a good thing, and I'm going to come back to databases, that says public agencies do not need to create a record where it is not already available. But that, so if you ask for something on a database and it would only require one keystroke for the public agency to manipulate the data. There's some clarification now in the law that as long as it's not a new program, but it's just putting the data in the format that you want, 
that um, that the public agency needs to do that. That's not considered creating a new um, record. And if you want to talk more um, specifically about that after lunch, we can. There's a whole code section there. It was actually written by some of the database editors at some of the dailies around the state that talked about that. Because that was a real stonewalling tactic where folks would ask for a list of names and uh, the public agency would write back, well, I just have a database. It's got everything. So I don't have it. I'm document with just the names. So you see how. Um, in any case, um, Let's see, I only have 10 more minutes on Open Records Act, so let me touch to you. We, I could talk about it all day. I could put you to sleep about it all day. But let me talk about two more, three more topics, and then we'll turn to re uh, meetings. Custodians of the record. Remember I told you, and you know, that the beginning process, the trigger, the impetus, is you file an open records request, and that starts the process. Well, there's always been sort of a vagueness in the law. Who does that open records request go to? And I um, would always say in a fallback position, um, write to the chief, write to the police chief, or write to the city manager. The 2012 version of the law, again drawing on FOIA, the Federal Act, instituted this idea of a designated custodian of the records. And I don't know whether I think that's a good thing or a bad thing. And I was talking with someone about that before we started. That means that there is somebody in every public agency designated to be the person to respond to open records requests. Now on the one hand, that could be a good thing because somebody allegedly knows a lot about open records requests. On the other hand, as the question was put to me, what if that person is out of the office? The way it's supposed to work, and I've been in all these technical discussions, um, well, you could put something on your email saying, um, I'm out of the office to this day, and go bring your request to so-and-so. I think it's not as simple a question. I don't have data yet. I don't know how many agencies have decided to designate a records custodian, but to the extent that your jurisdiction uh, has decided to do that, they need to publicize it. In other words, you need to put on the county or city's website who that person is, how to reach them, this or that. You can't just say there's somebody and not tell anybody who that is. But I'd be interested in hearing in the afternoon how many jurisdictions all of you are working in and whether or not there have been public records custodians designated. Because I, I, I was unsure in my mind when discussions about this took place in 2012 whether or not that was a good thing. So let me roll back, talk about one more topic, and then talk about what you mostly are probably here for, remedies under the law or lack thereof. So the process is simple. I, I, I shouldn't use that word. We know it's not simple. It's supposed to be simple. All public data is subject to the Open Records Act and release with certain exceptions. We start the process by way of an open records request. There are three business days in which to respond and three choices for the public agency to respond. The yes, the yes in a certain an estimated timetable. The no, public agency has is able to charge up to 25 cents per page for copying plus reasonable and, 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 See? Um, uh, up to 10 cents per page. See, remember? Doing this too long. Time to retire. Um, the, um, and uh, up to 10 cents per page plus reasonable search and retrieval time. We talked about custodians of the records. Let's pause for a moment when you get the no. When can a public agency say you can't have the records? And to be fair, there are quite a few instances, more than I care to admit, in Georgia's law where public information is not subject to release. Some things make sense. For example, it's as embarrassing that I know the numbers, <coughs> excuse me, under 501872A, which is the list of exceptions for what's not subject to release, number one is records that the federal government says is closed. State can't release. Some are obvious. Here's an obvious one, social security numbers. When I started this work, 
actually social security numbers were closed by federal law, but opened by state law. And I remember I was down at the General Assembly, and some committee member, rightly so, I was testifying, well, we need to keep social security numbers open. <coughs> and um, he, he looked at me and I said, okay, I know, I'm a single woman, I live alone, I, but anyway, it, it, since that time, social security numbers in the state are, are closed analogous to federal law. Other things, medical records, credit card information, other uh, personal information of public employees, and the list goes on. I would urge you to take a copy of this book because I, in the back, I reprinted the entire law, and you will see that the list, it's grown, unfortunately, since I started the work, which means maybe I'm doing a bad job. You can't, um, we've added lobbying groups show up um, at, understandably at the Capitol and say, oh, we need an exception to close information to X, Y, and Z. Carpool records, I mean, it's sometimes, you know, it just, unfortunately, I've been there enough now when I'll, at least to make my case, I, I sometimes say, um, committee members, do we really need an exception for this particular narrow group? So, but that's how the list of exceptions for data that's not releasable has grown. Um, DFACs, uh, Department of Family and Children's Services, some legitimate reasons for closure of their records, some not. Um, court records is a whole other thing to discuss, but when I talk about everything is subject to release, <coughs> our courts in Georgia have consistently said the general rule is openness, exceptions to release, meaning these one through 25 or so, whatever they are, should be narrowly construed. Jim's going to talk about that from a policy perspective. But the point is, we do have a list of stuff that the agency legitimately can withhold. We can talk more about some of those specifics after lunch. Um, I know there's a group from Cobb here that wants to talk about uh, the Braves negotiations and such, and whether that information uh, should have been subject to release. And I'll tell you right now that I certainly think more of it should have been released uh, than had, but we'll save that. But I do, I wouldn't be honest if I said everything is subject to disclosure. Um, for better or for worse, every state in the country has a list. Ours is no worse or better than any other states, but some information, some public information is not subject to release. So, the question you're all here for, I think, is what do you do when the Open Records Act doesn't work? I don't know. What do you do? Keep working. <laughs> tough, tough question when the open records process breaks down. And it's something that I, here's, um, you can certainly quote me as saying this, and it's something I've said for 18 years. I think what we need in Georgia is prevailing party attorney's fees, so more lawyers will take these cases and um, on a contingency basis or, but, and the law sounds like it says that now, but it doesn't. Here's what the law says. Here are the minimal choices. And remedies are weak, and Mr. Owens and I disagree on that, our attorney general. He keeps telling me how great the remedies are, and I keep saying, sir, sir, <laughs> sir. I said, I've never run for elected office, and, but I've been around the state as much as you talking to citizens groups, and the law isn't working. Um, okay. Let's start with um, something that came into the law in 1998, modeled on Florida. We didn't really have any remedies. So in 1998, the law changed to allow us to call the Attorney General's office and to use uh, a, open, a mediation program of sorts. Here are the bad parts of it, and then here are the good parts. The bad part is there's one Assistant Attorney General there who has 15 uh, jobs in addition to open records to uh, deal with. However, the idea behind that was nobody local in your jurisdiction is going to address the issues, so let's get a state official outside the county. So, there is that program in place. One can write to the uh, Senior Assistant Attorney General, many of you have tried to, I believe, Stefan Ritter, that's a gentleman, uh, S-T-E-F-A, 
and and last name is Ritter, and I can give you his email address. Um, what they will do is send a letter to Putnam County Commission that says essentially um, we've received a complaint against the Putnam County Commission because we're not releasing records. What's your position? Then, of course, the Putnam County Attorney is going to write back, so we're going to get into. I, I, I'm sure you all know more about whether this process is working or not, but that is available. The next option. Can I make a comment about that? Mm -hmm. uh, it would be good if that the Attorney General also wrote the County Commissioner so they know what's going on. Because obviously they don't. Well, I'm not sure I agree that they don't know what's going on, but uh, the more. <laughs> they say they don't. The right. They know the more, but anyway, that program is in place. Before I talk to you about litigation, here are some other things. I personally, yours truly, now please not everybody write me tomorrow because I'm going to take off tomorrow. But wait till Monday. <laughs> I'll write a letter, but I, I'm not, I, I can't be your lawyer, obviously. I will write a, a similar letter that has worked on occasion. Uh, once I was able to stop a meeting, I was so proud of myself. I will write and say, and my letterhead has just about every major um, media outlet on the right, and I'll say, look, we've heard that um, you, your practices don't look good. What's the problem? You're not releasing records. You're taking too long. You're charging too much. And the idea with that is more than just you are asking. It's Holly and somebody else, Holly and Jim and other people. There's outside people looking over it. So that's an option that happens. You, some of you, Jim, Obi, others, media, have even more power. Write a story about secrecy. I am not, of course I'm not a journalist. I don't, I don't subscribe to the thought that covering transparency is a conflict for the media. I think some media folks subscribe to that theory. Again, I'm not a journalist. I don't think so. Short of all those <laughs> perhaps ineffective, perhaps effective, uh, sporadically useful remedies, what do we have? Not much. Number one, a lawsuit in the superior county of where the alleged violation takes place. Now, is it practical to sue for the minutes of a meeting? No. <coughs> Who can afford it? Not I. The point is, superior court litigation is um, an option. It, it, it's the most tangible option on the books right now. It's there. You know, if you, um, there, are there any lawyers in the room besides me? You, you know that um, there's t tons of case law in every other jurisdiction. There's this much case law on open records and open meetings. Case law meaning very little litigation. The only um, entities that could afford to litigate these things were the big media change. So you get the, it's obvious that litigation isn't a practical or effective remedy, but it's certainly there. and. Um, one um, kid, and he is a kid, he's uh, trying to get into law school, or he was, did a great case against the city of Atlanta on an open meetings violation, Matthew Cardinale, if anybody knows him, um, did it pro se, he did it himself, and uh, I filed a couple of amicus or friends of the court brief, but um, he did a great job in trying to make the city of Atlanta city council conform on open meetings violations. It can be done, but it's not easy, and it's not practical. The other remedy that the law contemplates is even less so, and David Hudson and I, we had a big laugh once. David Hudson is the gentleman reference also, probably taught me everything I know, um, and, and some others did as well, about how many criminal prosecutions there were under the open records and meeting statute since the 60s, and I think we counted four. Yeah, I mean, so the idea is that um, the solicitor, state court, or the district attorney, it's unclear to me in the law, does have jurisdiction to cite the public official for wrongdoing. For, um, there's somebody in the room here who wants to, or was going to come and talk to me about what willfulness means. I don't know who. And somebody sent me a package overnight in the mail uh, to talk about making a big county and willful violations. Um, the point is for these criminal prosecutions to cite the public officials for wrongdoing. Um, there has to be some showing of malice, willfulness, intent. That also crops up in the civil, um, civil, a civil piece of litigation is 
for money, essentially, and criminal is for jail. N no local district attorney or solicitor is going to cite their next door neighbor or their um, um, boss for wrongdoing. So um, I would say be aware of criminal violations. Um, I wouldn't count on them. There is something new, though, that I actually have a private case that I am trying to litigate that I'll let you know if it works. So something in the law said, and I may lose on it, so that won't do us any good. Um, in addition to the attorney general suing, citizens now can ask for civil fines in the context of other lit litigation. And um, in federal court on a case, anybody here from Forsyth County? Um, that woman who got thrown out of the um, yeah. Cumming City. Yeah, I'm representing her in my private capacity. Again, private lawyer versus this, although the First Amendment Foundation is um, helping um, on, just because the Attorney General won his lawsuit, he's not gonna litigate every dispute, is she shut out of her own remedies. And I'm on a motion for reconsideration with the uh, federal court about that very issue, just because the attorney general won, does that preclude a citizen also from this idea of civil fines? Even if I win, though, I don't know whether that, I mean, is $1,000, $2,500 a real threat to any public agency? We're paying it as the taxpayers. But in any case, I trans, what's the word? I move on, although I'm going to ask you to say a few words so I can have my coffee, and then we'll move on to open meetings. I leave you with the thought that I am unhappy, too, about the remedies um, for open records and meetings violations. I don't think they're good. And again, this is where Mr. Owens and I ser have serious disagreements, because he keeps telling me the um, cracked his teeth, and I literally keep jumping up and down, are you kidding me? Uh, but uh, that aside, there's more work to be done on that. Um, anybody interested? Um, and, um, but I don't have a lot of good news on that other than people like Jim fighting the good fight um, and others mm -hmm. trying to um, do enforcement. Do you want to say, or why don't we do a couple questions sure. and then sure. meetings so I can? Yeah. Questions relative to records.